So good morning. Good morning, if I could just have your attention as we come back to the program. My name is Josh Blank. I'm a professor uh, here at NYU Law School. And I'm also the faculty director of the Graduate Tax Program. Uh, on behalf of the Graduate Tax Program, I'd just like to, uh, well, first welcome you all back from the break, but also uh, on behalf of the tax program, thank KPMG uh, for hosting this annual event. For the past 16 years, this event has been one of the true highlights of our academic year uh, by bringing together so many practitioners, government officials, students, and tax academics. This lecture series allows us to think about a timely and important tax topic from practical and theoretical perspectives. As we're coming back from the break, I'd also just like to take a moment especially to acknowledge and thank Larry Pollack for all of the work that he's done to put this event together. And if we could just take a moment to acknowledge Larry. I can tell you from personal experience over the last six or seven years of working with Larry on this event that Larry loves NYU and he really loves the NYU KPMG annual lecture series. And so we thank Larry and his whole team for organizing this event. This event, by the way, is one of the only programs I think that NYU Law School hosts that every year uh, closes in terms of registration. This room only holds 450 people. Every year, Larry is looking for new ways to improve the series. We do have a Skirball uh, Center for Performing Arts that has a theater which holds 850 people, so maybe by the 20th uh, NYU KPMG lecture, we can reach uh, that venue, who knows? Uh, and also, I should acknowledge uh, the fact that this series has expanded over the years. Uh, last December, we were thrilled to co-host this event in San Francisco uh, when we were able to reconnect with many of our alumni and other tax, tax practitioners in the Bay Area uh, for this program later in the year. So thank you for all of your work on this program. Uh, I would just, just for a couple of moments, tell you a little bit about what's going on at NYU. The tax program is as strong as ever. This has been a really exciting year for us because it is the 70th year of the graduate tax program and the 20th year of the international tax program. We just hosted on March 24th an anniversary celebration to commemorate both of those events, and I know many of you were there with us at that program. If you're enjoying today's program, we invite you and hope uh, that you can attend uh, some of the many programs that we host during the year. Specifically, I'll just mention that starting in June of this year, NYU Law School and the Graduate Tax Program will be co-hosting a global series of conferences on BEPS. Uh, we will be co-hosting this series with the Amsterdam Center for Tax Law, the University of Sao Paulo, and the Central University of Finance and Economics in Beijing. The first conference will take place on June 1st in Amsterdam. On October 28th, we'll host a day-long conference on BEPS uh, here at NYU. And then in 2017, we'll host two more conferences in Beijing and in Sao Paulo. Those dates we'll have soon. Uh, many of our events are posted on the NYU Law Tax Blog, and if you're alumni of the program, you should be receiving announcements about our different events, and we invite you to come back to the law school whenever you're free. I'd also like to just take a moment on that note to acknowledge many of our alumni who are here today. Our alumni support the graduate tax program and the international tax program by teaching as adjuncts in both of our programs, speaking on panels at the law school, mentoring our students, and supporting activities of both programs through financial commitments, through the Wallace Lyon Eustace Fund. Uh, you and your passion for our programs is really what's uh, the core foundation of the tax program at NYU and distinguishes us from all other programs. So thank you for all of your support. Thank you for KPMG for co-hosting this event and enjoy the rest of today's events. I'll now turn the program back to Larry to introduce the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josh, for those kind words, uh, which are very much appreciated. Uh, as the global tax landscape is evolving, so are the functions, the focus, and the visibility of corporate tax departments, of multinational enterprises. Our next panel includes senior officers representing corporate America from various industries who will share their perspectives and discuss the additional skills that may be required of corporate tax executives of the future. 
This panel is going to be moderated by Brett Weaver of KPMG. Brett is an international tax partner of KPMG based in Seattle. Brett's practice focuses primarily in the technology and the telecommunications space and on cloud computing. Brett is the partner in charge of KPMG's tax transparency services and of the West Area International Tax Practice. Please join me in welcoming our corporate panelists today. Harris Horowitz, Global Head of Tax for BlackRock. Kanti Srikanta, Vice President of Tax Operations at IBM. Joe Vaccaro, Senior Vice President and Global Tax Director for MetLife. And Louise Weingrad, Vice President, Global Taxation at Johnson & Johnson. Brett, over to you. Thanks, Larry. Uh, appreciate the introduction, and we uh, look forward to the panel discussion today. I'm confident you'll find it to be of interest. I think the uh, prior panel sessions really did a great job of setting the stage for what we wanted to discuss today. And uh, particularly in this setting at the, uh, at, at the law school that many of you here that are students, uh, I, I would say listen up because we're going to talk about uh, really the skill sets and uh, the, the unique challenges of running a tax department in the future. And I think there'll be some interesting things there, um, frankly, for all of us. But uh, you know, with that, we'd like to just go ahead and, and jump into this very question that is our subject, which is thinking about the future. And what are the requirements for the tax department of uh, major multinational companies addressing these issues? And much of what we've uh, heard in the prior panels uh, are really captured on this slide. And so I don't intend to spend uh, a lot of time here. But, but I do think it's interesting as you look at the, the changing environment. And we probably have seen more change in the last few years than we, we did see in maybe a couple of decades before that. Uh, but you look at the massive changes around uh, political and social issues, addressing tax, uh, you know, tax being mainstream, you know, issues in a number of different, uh, you know, countries. And when has that happened, you know, for decades prior to that in terms of uh, any of our careers? So certainly, um, you know, an, an increased emphasis from a social and political perspective around tax and, uh, and the underlying issues uh, with large multinationals and how they do business around the globe. As we look at uh, you know, information, communication, and technology, th as that has uh, you know, really grown, it's, it's really also been, as you think about it, a significant impact on large multinationals and, and again, how they do business. Um, information is available to almost anyone. Uh, you know, all, again, uh, NGOs, uh, you know, customers, others can uh, you know, publish you know, information, comments, et cetera, about companies, particular, about how they do business. Um, you know, we, we look at these, uh, you know, issues of how quickly information is made available. You know, you look at LuxLeaks, as we've talked about earlier, and, uh, you know, the Panama leaks, et cetera. Um, you, you, this has really changed, changed the game, and not only in terms of information that's widely available, but these new technologies and how they actually impact business. Uh, you know, you look at the uh, convergence across, uh, you know, what has traditionally been separate, uh, you know, industries, and we see now this convergence amongst all industries. Uh, I think it's interesting, those of you who are uh, watching the news to, you know, even today, right, uh, a lot of discussion about, you know, Netflix stock as they have uh, their release, et cetera, right? Uh, and, and part of that story was the fact that, that, you know, Amazon is one of the new competitors. And it isn't that interesting as you stop to think about it that, you know, Amazon originally, right, resells books online. Right? And, and here they are with their you know, original programming around uh, media and content and, be, and emerging as a competitor against uh, you know, Netflix. So we see all these things starting to come together. Uh, you see traditional uh, manufacturers, right? manufacturers of uh, jet airline engines that actually can do you know, maintenance of, uh, you know, of those engines remotely uh, over the Internet. Right? So we're seeing uh, all of these things change the way companies do business change the way governments think about how they, they wish to and should, you know, tax multinational organizations. Uh, you look at, uh, you know, digitization and how that impacts business. Uh, you know, I saw um, a, a video that was presented by a client not too long ago where they were actually, um, you know, printing, 3D printing a car, some assembly required, right? But, uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, you, you could actually do that and think about that. No longer would you be necessarily shipping an automobile, you know, uh, across uh, multiple jurisdictions that, uh, you know, again, it's the basic supplies to 3D print that thing. 
Uh, so very interesting. You think about how this changes, you know, companies, how we think about rights to taxation, um, and similar issues as we look at this third pillar, the economic issues that are underlying the story. And uh, you know, as, as we look at uh, you know these uh, the, you know these issues of uh, some of the higher tax you know countries that are are really putting pressure on lower tax jurisdictions in terms of, of substance, and a lot of that is really you know this tug and war in terms of uh, rights to taxation. We've seen that with uh, the rise of source country taxation as well, and just an underlying theme in, in what we see today in terms of ultimately. Who should bear the burden of taxation? And an interesting question that doesn't seem to get a lot of airplay, but it's out there, which is if, if there's more burden of taxation that should be borne by multinationals, d does it stop there? Or somehow at the end of the day, does that move on to consumers as well? So, so here, here's the environment, and uh, when we get to the panel, we'll have them uh, really kind of, I, I think, address to, to some extent what you view the future to actually be, you know, is that, is that now? Is it, uh, you know, is it a few years from now? Is it 10 years from now? Uh, but we want to frame that discussion around what the panel's identified as these five key areas, five challenges. You'll see the fifth one, it really kind of uh, goes across the, the top four, and that's really thinking about the organization to deal with these challenges. But as we look at uh, you know, this, the, the rapid change of uh, rules across the globe and getting our arms around controlling that risk, as we look at the reputational and brand recognition issues that were addressed in the first panel, also you know, just compliance. It seems that the, uh, the price tag for compliance failures has risen significantly in the last couple of years. And a lot of that burden comes back to corporate tax departments to really uh, figure out how we get our arms around the compliance uh, complexities and actually build processes and, and have the necessary tools to ensure that we do comply. And then this idea of integration, that uh, probably more so than ever, uh, you know, we want to cover this issue that the tax department needs to be integrated into the business and the stakeholders. So let's jump into our panel discussion and, and you know, Conti, maybe I'll turn first to you to, to start our discussion here around, uh, around controlling risk. I mean, how does, how does your company get their arms around all these rapid changes? It, it's an interesting question, and I like what you have on the, on the chart there, what happened to the rule of law, you know? So there's been a lot that's going on in the past few years. So we had the OECD BEPS project, a lot of discussions, a lot of guidelines came out of it. And then we saw that UK came out with its own law not totally aligned with all those guidelines. And then now you have EU, which is coming out with the uh, directives, which are not completely aligned or agreed to by the countries in the OECD BEPS project. So in all this, the big question, if you have the responsibility to have the right reporting on the financial statements, is how do you, how do you measure this uncertainty that's going on? And obviously, we don't have the answers. We have to wait how the rule of law turns out to be in the different countries. But in the meantime, it's, it's a challenge. Then, of course, there, is, there are other things like um, the uh, transfer pricing, right? So at least there we have some idea of where the future is going. And the one-sided transfer pricing, if anybody has one-sided transfer pricing based on which they are justifying a return to a specific country, um, that's not going to hold anymore, or at least you're going to need to have some kind of a global profit split or some corroborative method to substantiate this one-sided transfer pricing if, if we did have it. So at least there, there is certainty, but the question is there is a lot of work to be done before you actually know the answer, whether you, know, you have enough justifications. Then there is the country-by-country -country reporting, which there was a lot of discussion earlier this morning in the, in the panel. And as much as we would all like to believe that it will be confidential and say it does not remain confidential, and I guess you know, forgetting all the information about revenue and the tax exposures, there are some business competitive information like our labor structure, which probably is going to become public, right? Because if it does become public. So those are risks that we have to manage within the company and I guess you know, from a competitiveness perspective, which I, I don't have the answers of how to, how to manage it, but th these are things that worry us when we're talking about you know, managing risks. And lastly, controversy with all this going on in the world, it's, you know, c companies like, say, IBM, we've, we are boots on the ground in many, many countries and we pay taxes everywhere. We are, you know, probably going to get swept up in this wave of um, 
I don't know, a change in environment in how tax authorities view us, view multinationals, not just us, IBM, or some other company. And we just have to be prepared how to deal with this new controversial controversy uh, environment, which was not the same. I mean, just dealing with UK HMRC is different now than it was, you know, a couple of years ago or even a year ago. So these are all, you know, environment changes, no answers, but these are things we're worrying about how to figure out how do you end up controlling risk or how do you think about risk in this, in this new environment. I don't know if my panelists yeah, have... I'll, I'll just add one thing on the controversy point. I think it's an excellent point. Uh, MetLife the same way, right? So we do business in, in uh, multiple, multiple countries. And there's an issue about being consistent on your positions across jurisdictions, right? And there's not always a consistent application of general principles to, to these types of issues. So I, I think there is a risk of making sure you're managing. People think a controversy is as dealing with um, the IRS on your issues, but, but when you look at multiple countries and, and managing these sort of relationships and issues um, with the tax regulator and, and, and the non-tax regulators, uh, it, I think it's, it's an increasing risk, uh, especially in an environment where countries are looking for revenue. So I think that's something we, we monitor very closely. Yeah. Right. I, I, I think there's a, a huge challenge and opportunity um, to develop a, an outside-in perspective where we step out of our technical tax expertise, which may tell us our pricing is correct, our pricing is sound, we, we've done the work to follow the rules, and we start to understand that from the perspective of many governments, certainly NGOs, <coughs> the question is not what do the technical rules tell you the answer is, but how come you have so much revenue in this country you and you don't pay more tax? Uh, they ignore the fact or don't understand or care to understand the fact that you've invested heavily to develop the product or the service somewhere, you've uh, perhaps invested heavily to make the product or service somewhere else, and those countries deserve remuneration for that. And they focus um, very consistently on revenue only, and that's an entirely different perspective that we as tax people will have because it's technically uh, irrelevant. Right. And we have to understand that in order to be prepared to address and respond successfully. So the rules of the game, I mean, we may feel very confident we all follow the rules of the game, but, but, but the outside perspective is quite changing. different. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, interestingly, just kind of picking up on the, the topic that the panel is discussing here is, we're, you know, we're looking at that issue of, uh, you know, jurisdictions' right to tax income. And, uh, and, and certainly the country by country report's gonna only add the fuel to the fire, right, in mm -hmm. terms of, well, here's the revenue or here's the employees, right? Um, so we, we have this new standard out of, uh, you know, BEPS actions point eight through 10 about uh, transfer pricing. Some would say it's a clarification, I would call it new, but uh, you know, the, the quote we have up here on the slide as well that um, you know, US Treasury has seemed to, been, seems to have been fairly vocal about the view that existing transfer pricing regulations encompass these principles. Um, you know, how, how do you deal with that when on the one side you have you know, a pretty significant body of US regulations around transfer pricing and we have kind of where the world seems to be going, how do you balance, in, in, in coming back to that issue, do the U.S. regulations really speak to uh, issues such as BEPS, and, and how do you deal with that in terms of your transfer pricing? Anyone want to take that one on? <laughs> right. I don't think anybody has an answer for that yet. <laughs> well, um, I mean, I, I, I think we don't have an answer in part because the U.S. rules are pretty broad and comprehensive, and if applied and enforced, you'd think they would cover what needs to be covered, right? But that doesn't address why do I have large revenues in a developing country where I don't develop a product or make the product, and I only pay tax on profit, which is a small percentage of revenues. That doesn't address that fundamental question. Yeah, and I think it really does uh, get back to the issue of value creation, and uh, certainly the company will have their story about what value creation is and, and that profits are aligned with where value is created, but I think that's the challenge, right, that uh, many of the governments will have a different perspective right. that, you know, what's happening here in my jurisdiction is actually extremely valuable. Right, mm -hmm. and I think the, the value creation is getting more and more clarity, or if you will, definition around what what makes sense in the in the BEPS project as much as you know we, we might say the US regulations 
say the same thing. I think there is more clarity now, which might be nobody paid attention to, which we will have to st start paying attention to, I think. So that's where all the differences are coming up, with the fact that there's more identification, okay, where are you making the product, where are you designing the product, where are you developing the product, so. Yeah, great point, Kanti. Well, let's move on to uh, one of our, our other key challenges we want to spend some time on, and that's brand and reputation. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll turn to you, Luis. I mean, certainly uh, with Johnson & Johnson, uh, you know, the, the success of your company has been the trust that you have from uh, consumers and probably even throughout the supply chain. What role does tax play in such a valuable brand and reputation? Sure. So it's, uh, you know, Johnson & Johnson is... Uh, both the name of the company and uh, one of the larger, uh, more valuable trust marks in the world. And um, so protecting the reputation when you're a consumer-facing company is, is an extremely key priority. I think every company uh, cares about its reputation, should care about its reputation for many reasons, including employee engagement. But when the consumer's decision to buy has a lot to do with trusting, whether you're good for their baby or good for their skin or whatever, it becomes an extremely high priority. Now we have the um, somewhat unique privilege of also being a pharmaceutical and a medical device company. So in addition to the consumer products, we're also a highly government regulated company, which means that as a farm company, we're one of the prime, a US farm company, we're one of the prime targets of a lot of international initiatives. We're US, which makes us a bad guy. We're a US multinational, I should say, which <laughs> makes us a bad guy. And a farm company makes us a bad guy. So we've, we've got the combination of a big target and huge concern about not only doing the right thing, but also how that plays to the public in terms of reputation. And what that means is that really any news headlines having to do with tax are probably not good news headlines. Um, what we've noticed is that as soon as tax comes up in public hearings, uh, anywhere in the world that holds public hearings on tax, or in NGO type documents, or sometimes even among our presidential candidates, uh, there's a very quick line from tax to pricing if you're a pharmaceutical company and the government is involved in either setting pricing or subsidizing individuals to other behaviors that are considered negative, maybe class action lawsuits, maybe environmental. Um, very, very quick line. So tax becomes the initial focus, uh, accusation of you're ripping us off to statement around uh, why is that, how, when we're setting pricing or helping to help people afford your products, to aren't you really a bad actor? And um, this came up even in, um, in January uh, when one of our candidates, who might be the leading Republican candidate, made a comment about um, another farm company that at the time was planning to invert, and another company whose name included Johnson and noted that uh, because these two companies are inverting, they have no business talking about pricing. So it, we weren't even the right target of that uh, nasty <laughs> comment, and we still got the, uh, the quick link from tax inversion to pricing. So it's a, it's a very challenging area, and it's not what you're taught in law school, uh, at least when I went to law school. We focused on trying to understand the law, trying to under see around the corner to where the law is going, as a tax professional, you think a lot about um, not only complying with the law, but what, what, what's the most um, appropriate way to comply with the law and also achieve a return for your shareholders. We're not trained to think about uh, communications and media and not fully trained to think about government affairs. And what, what this whole international seismic shift has led to is a tremendous need, not to become an expert in those areas, but to know enough and to have very, in a company, to have very, very strong partnership with people who are um, doing digital listening to keep an eye on what's going on in terms of reputation, with the communications people who help you uh, speak outwardly. Actually, if they're here today, they might not like what I'm saying. <laughs> um, I, I don't think they are. Um, with government affairs, with law department, with everyone connected to the sorts of accusations and the sorts of impacts that come from tax being in the headlines. So it's a different world. Th thanks, Lisa. 
Yeah, go ahead, uh, Harris. I, I think those are terrific comments. Uh, you know, for the law students in the room, uh, you, you're going to need to know your tax law, but you're also going to need to be a great communicator because the world of tax uncertainty is just getting much more difficult, whether it's because of bets, <coughs> what's happening in the U.S. or in the media, you're going to need to be a very effective communicator. Being an effective communicator internally to the topic we just discussed about risk, what is the risk? Sometimes you won't have a clear answer. People need a number. You don't have the number. It could be anywhere from zero to a number that could bankrupt the company. Okay. To communicating to the public and thinking about what you do today, how it might be portrayed in three years from now when that line has changed. I mean, we can, some of us can recall tax shelters. We never thought we had them. And then they became public. We had them. And <laughs> You've done your planning three years ago, and now they're suddenly bad before they were good. And no disparagement to some of the tax bar, but a lot of us got opinions that said it's good. It's good from a technical perspective, assuming all the reps worked out, but it may not be good from a public persona perspective. I guess one tip I would that we have taken on board is to be very active in policy setting, which is to sort of also think about going backwards a bit, what are governments thinking about? What are they concerned about? Is there a medium to solve those problems while at the same time getting a more certain and fair result uh, for the general public? That doesn't mean that tax is a moral obligation, but I think tax people need to be more communicative and they also need to be more involved in policy setting in order, in a sense, to make our own bed and be comfortable that we can live in that bed uh, as well. Thanks, Harris. Um, fi final comment? J just, um, I, I think what Harris just said is terribly important, both because we care about what the policy is and have unique perspectives that will impact it, and also because uh, the, one of the positive aspects of managing reputation is to show up and to show up to government authorities, to show up to the OECD, to show up to the EU, to show up to regional authorities as people interested in achieving the right solutions, not just for your own company, but for the for the for business and for workers, and to show up as partners in that. So it's very important. That, that's a great point, and I, I would add, uh, you know, from the advisor side, I see that. You know, that many of and all of you here on the panel, actually, your companies, you've been very active from that responsibility perspective of being at the table, right? Trying trying to work through very important issues on both sides and get to an answer that makes sense. And one thing I'd like to add what Harris said in terms of you know, the ability to communicate simply, clearly, is, is very important. And like Luis said before, you know, it's one thing for Johnson & Johnson that it's a consumer, you know, they have a lot of consumer relationship or consumers have an impact on the, on the company. Even if you don't, you need to have that. So there is no future in being a tax professional where you say, okay, if I do this, Maybe I don't have to have all these skills. I can just do a, a tax job, a tax research job. It's not there. I think if in, in the yeah. future it's really this combination of you know, how, how good you are technically, how can you communicate. In any industry you go, in any profession you are, you know, in a firm or whatever, you, you need that skill. So. It's a very important Yeah, point. thanks, Conti. And I'm, I'm sure when we get to the final uh, topic yeah. we want to cover in yes. terms of the tax organization skill set, that's going to come up again. So. <laughs> Uh, let's move on to uh, you know, getting our arms around compliance. Certainly, we talked about a lot of uh, or a number of key risk areas, right? Everywhere from the technical, very complex rules to the reputations and identifying stakeholders. A very complex and I would say significantly different environment for uh, you know VP of Tax to, to to deal with all these issues, and, and so. How do you do it? Joe, let's uh, yeah, turn so this to it's, you. It's, uh, so compliance is sort of a funny word in the, in the tax. Mexican, right? So I think you say 15, 20 years ago, I think compliance meant you're, you're filing your tax return, right? It's your 1120 to the IRS. Um, so I know I was here. So if I was working on compliance in my first job, that meant I left my class uh, upstairs at about 8 o'clock. I had to go back to the office to work on somebody's tax return and miss, uh, miss Monday Night Football, whatever else I wanted to be doing at the time. So I think today, if you look at this, though, this is illustrative of the way tax is getting more complicated, right? We're talking about compliance, which really includes this rapidly changing regulatory environment and, and how, do, uh, how do companies um, 
work into that and fit into this this framework to make sure we're being uh, we're we're complying with the rules, right? And so uh, the slide talks about enterprise risk management. Uh, I think that's a uh, a huge deal for for enterprise. It's becoming a bigger uh, corporate function in in big multinationals, uh, and tax certainly has to feed into that and be integrated into that. Um, you know, I think you see you'll see boards and audit committees uh, increasingly more interested in tax issues. I, I know I've seen that personally, where we're presenting to the audit committee on what we think the uh, the tax issues are for the company currently and in the future, what our risks are. Um, you know, we've talked a bit about CBC and, and BEPS and some other things. Um, I think so. There's there's these anti-abuse rules that are out. There's this, these additional reporting requirements that are out. Um, there's a concern we mentioned before about confidentiality, which is important. Um, you know, you think about transfer pricing, which is a big issue that, that every, uh, every country is worried about. There's indirect taxes and, and new types of taxes that, that countries are applying. And so for the tax department, uh, it's really important to be able to get your arms around that, um, to have the right controls over that, and to have your tax operating model um, ready to address that. And by tax operating model, I mean you either have resources on the ground who are able to uh, deal with those issues and, and communicate them up, or you co-source or you use a firm, but, but you really have to be able to you know, understand what that issue in France is uh, from, from, your, from your desk in, in the US or New York, uh, because the last thing you want is something to sort of pop up and you're getting, you're getting the question coming down. That communication should come up. And, and you know, to Harris's point before in communication, I think it's, I'll say it again, uh, it's critical in these things to be able to communicate these risks uh, to senior management and to the board uh, and to be able to do it in a way that's, that's clear and concise and that people can understand. Uh, I'm sure Harris and I could talk after this for an hour about some of this stuff and he might be slightly interested, but I can tell you for sure, if you're talking to a non-tax person, they have a pretty small window of patience about what, how much technical detail you want, right? So you, you really have to be able to like do the elevator speech, right? Or pretend you're telling your 10-year-old son about it. That's, that's sort of the framework I try to do. And you know you can't mention code sections unless you absolutely have to. So I, I do think, and we've all said it, the communication, especially in this environment where you know people are very busy and, and there's the million things going on, you have to be able to sort of put in a bite-size uh, morsel here. Here's what's important. Here's sort of the tax exposure. Here's the number and I can give you more information if you want it. And, uh, and, and for these compliance risks, I think it's, it's critical. And I guess just the last point I'll make here on transactions and high risk, I mean, uh, you know, we've all been involved in, in different forms of transactions. Uh, there's a tax element to all of that, uh, and it's important that, that we get the right tax answer. Um, but I think you have to, in this environment, look at, again, what is, you know, what's the reputational risk, if you will, or what is the uh, what, what are the regulatory aspects of it or the business aspects? I can tell you from, from my personal experience, we do even like an internal restructuring, which is just done for, for pure business reasons or management reporting reasons. You really have to keep an eye on what the local regulators, both tax and non-tax, have to say about that. Um, and it's, it, it adds time to transactions, and it may, but you have to, it's something you have to line up in advance or uh, you're going to have problems later. Thanks, Joe. You know, it's uh, it, it, just taking off of your comments. It's always been my view that um, you know, prior to Sarbanes Oxley, you know, tax was certainly just a black box, right? And uh, that just kind of my view is you typically see, you know, Sarbanes Oxley came in, and and so more processes and controls around tax. Uh, but but even there, it's kind of my view that okay, you know, senior management, as long as we're you know clicking along with all the processes and controls, it must be good. Right, and, and now we're moving into an age where I think I better really understand what's happening, you know, in tax. And so, are, are you? So, question for the panel: Are you seeing more of an integration, uh, you know, with the overall enterprise risk management approach within your organizations, and you're working more closely with maybe chief risk officers, etc., where really it's more transparency, and you're integrated overall from an inter enterprise risk management perspective. How do I think, the Harris? I mean, Brad, definitely. The chief risk officer, uh, he's my best buddy on tax. <laughs> uh, and before that, he, he just sort of knew the individual tax rates. <laughs> um, but yes, it is a significant concern because one of the uncertainty in the scale 
I mean, in our business, we have products. So we might, you know, we're straight multinational performing services, but we also have a whole bunch of products. And those products, they're at, their scale is greater than that of our company. And so we need to worry about well, what's happening on that side of the fence, even though it doesn't really show up, hopefully, yet on our balance sheet. Um, so yes, I think it, it, there's a, really a two-way street here in that you know, tax should be at the table around enterprise risk management because it is significant. Um, you know, for many service companies, it's probably the second or third largest cost that a company has. Um, and two, you really have to worry about you need to know enough <laughs> so you're, you're assessing your risks. Because if the business is transforming itself and you don't know that, you're already behind the eight ball. Because the kind of transfer pricing that you had, I, I tell some of our transfer pricing people, don't smoke what you make, which is, you know, <laughs> don't be so convinced that what you've done fits all the rules. Because someone else with a, a clean eye might look at it and say, that has no philosophical uh, strength to it. It doesn't make sense. You're starting from the wrong premise. So I think enterprise risk is definitely an issue. Uh, just generally on Joe's comment around compliance risk, compliance is getting harder and more difficult. The bar is certainly ra being raised. And I think the issue <coughs> for tax departments of the future is how do you do all of that efficiently? And I think it's a significant challenge yeah. to tax departments because I don't think senior management, they appreciate how much more difficult compliance has become and how important it is. If you don't get country by country reporting right, you have 30, 40 controversies just lined up in the next couple of years. So how do you really do compliance right, but do it efficiently? I don't have the answer, but that's for the future. All right. Well, thank you, Harris. Uh, in the interest of time and covering our topics, okay. uh, you all right with that? No, I just quick wanted comment. To Go ahead, Conti. A, a I never want to cut you off. On so. the on the monitoring <laughs> developments, it's an interesting point. I mean, we have country tax teams in in a lot of countries who who do filter up information of the changes that are coming through. But we also, after after the OECD project kicked off, we put a team together which, you know, whose, whose main, I guess, objective is to go around making sure they catch up on all the, you know, there's thousands of pages yeah. that come out from the BEPS project to go over it and see how it applies to um, us in specific, our facts, and then kind of filter up and have discussions with the, you know, the management team to figure out what our next step should be. So we are on the, on the point that you made, Joe, before on, on communications, very important. Yeah. And we, come up with different ways to keep up and, and have the communication flowing and the analysis flowing all, all around, yep. so. Thanks, Conti. I'm, I'm picking up on a theme here of uh, communication skills and yeah. the fact that actually tax is making friends. People want to be your friend now, Harris. So, <laughs> they uh, know what we do. <laughs> yeah. Now they know what we do. Boy, big changes, so. <laughs> yeah, good and bad. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, well, speaking of that, I mean, you kind of teed that topic up, uh, right. right, Harris, of working with the business. And as, as I was thinking about this one, by the way, um, I was just thinking, you know, the, the substantive changes, and there's been a little bit of discussions already around, uh, you know, the new 385 rules, right? So in, in the day, you know, the Treasury just does what they need to do and send some money over here, and you knew what the tax consequences of that was, right? If it's debt, you get a deduction. It's a, how, how do you deal with you know, all these uncertainties and deal with these business partners around these significant tax issues the way it keeps evolving? I, I think in terms of integration, the basics are still there. You need to have a good sense of who your stakeholders are. You need to develop a two-way uh, means of communication that is, you're just not going to them, they're also coming to you, they're thinking of you when they're doing things or thinking about things. Uh, you also want to ensure that you, you have the right seat at the right table at the right point in time, whether it's you know an enterprise risk committee or some other governance structure. Uh, and you also want to ensure that you communicate well, uh, simply, but also that you don't communicate so simply that the parties that you're talking to think it's no risk or that there aren't trade-offs that have to be thought through. I mean, we can save a lot in taxes if you're willing to put the brand or reputation at risk. If you're willing, this is the classic APB 23, if you're willing to keep the earnings offshore, we can keep a low tax rate. Um, 
So those are trade-offs. So those are basics, and I think we'll just have to do better at that, and I think the tax department of the future will need to be even more ingrained in the business. I mean, some trends are concerning in terms of integration. I think many of us, you know, through what's happened, starting really probably in the, in the 80s through today, you had greater um, access to information on an immediate basis, plus you have very uh, strong and tight supply chains and value chains. Is BEPS and its progeny really anti-integration? Is it going to cause countries to sort of think at what's going on in their country very myopically and say, you know, you can't run an integrated business. You should be on a profit split, and we're all, go all going to argue about, you know, 40 different countries' view of how do you split value. So that, that's one issue that I think, you know, the future tax department's going to need to think about. And the second one is obviously uh, technology. Um, you can be doing business everywhere, but doing it nowhere. And the issue there is, you know, for very tech-focused companies, and I think all of our companies, even if they're all line, are increasingly going to be on, on using things on the web. The issue is, even BEPS, they gave up on Action 1, in, in my mind. Um, <laughs> There's nothing really ca came out of that except it's, you know, the beginnings of a study. Most of the other actions, I think, are more concrete yep. and give government something to work on. But being able to, if you're a technologist and you're sitting in San Francisco and you want to set up a new company, you go to Ireland and set it up and you do everything you would have done. So that's not a bad inversion, but that's exactly what U.S. tax policy is telling you to do. So I think those trends are going to make integration even more difficult, but it is happening besides, ta you know, despite tax, and we need to be prepared for that. Thanks, Harris. I, I uh, great comments, and uh, there's some excellent take home points there. I wish we had more time to spend some time on that, but I want to get to the last topic here and give each of our panel members an opportunity to speak to this, uh, this issue. Which is, uh, you know, taking, uh, you know, taking into account everything we just talked about. What skills and resources, both from a you know, technology process, uh, human capital, you know, do you need for the tax organization of the future to deal with these issues? What does a best-in-class organization look like? And, and Conti, maybe we'll, we'll start with you to kick it off, and we'll go through the panel and hopefully save a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, and I'm going to do it quickly because we touched on this a lot, but I'm going to pick the one that's very close to my heart, um, which is technology and, and process. So. You know, it's very important to get to a point where some of the compliance, you know, that Joe mentioned before and Harris, that it, it happens a little bit more automatically instead of with a lot of supervision. And a lot of time is spent on analytics and almost predictive. You know, there's, there's a lot of tools like, you know, you, everybody has heard about uh, Watson and IBM. It, ha it can do a lot of predictive um, analytics on, on data that's fed into it. So I would like to see us spending more time on feeding data into tools like those and figuring out you know, uh, more futuristic visions of where things are going instead of spending a lot of time on how to calculate depreciation. Do you see what I mean? So I think those are the kind of things to me are, are very important if we want to get to the next level of, of being this tax department which has under control all the basics and actually is looking into the future a lot more. So that's, that's the one I'm going to pick. Perfect. Actually, Conti, we would have been disappointed if you didn't pick technology. <laughs> you didn't mention Watson, improving yeah, automated right? processes, right? So, yeah, perfect. All right, Luis, uh, your thoughts? Well, I, I agree with that. And um, I, my, my thought is that what a, a tax organization has in terms of assets are people and some value in technology, hopefully uh, more, more as we go forward. But just focusing on the people for the moment, I, it, it feels right now like it must have been an easy thing to have a tax organization in the past because all your people had to do was to be kind of good technically and good diligent yeah. workers and a little creative. Yeah. And that was a good tax organization. And now, as we've been discussing, your people have to be, uh, have those skill sets plus communications, technology, um, uh, partnering. Uh, the ability to see beyond corners, the ability to see from perspectives that have nothing to do with technical tech. There's this whole other range of, of needs that we have in people and, and leadership type needs 
And so it's become a, a much more uh, important to have exceptional people who are continuously trained and stretching, making sure they stay good tax technical experts or else the whole thing falls apart, yep. but that you have all these other skill sets. Um, it, it makes for a very diverse group of people in the future in a tax department. At J&J, &J, the tax department used to be filled with tax people. Now we have IT people with us. We have uh, finance people who are experts in process. We have change management communications people. We have all sorts of other skill sets that become necessary. And, and these well. are part of the tax group, right? Uh, the tax yeah, department. Yeah. Tax the, controllers the, and those um, types of things. They, yeah. they need yeah. to be. Yeah. 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 Great. Thanks, Louise. Harris, your comments. Um, I, I agree that you're going to need to be multitask, but at the end of the day, you're still at the bottom of this chain. You still yeah. need to be a competent tax professional. Yes. And I think you also need, especially if you work in, in, in a cross-border context, to be what our chairman would call as a global citizen. You have to be sensitive to what's going on elsewhere. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more going on in Europe about uh, tax abuse and tax evasion than there is in the States. And when you're speaking to your people overseas and the business folks, they're reading everything in, in, in The Guardian about that. Um, you have to think globally, and I think you also need to think about being a consistent learner. You, you have to learn from your mistakes. You have to be sensitive to how, how other people, other firms are solving problems. Um, I think it takes a much better professional now than it did five or ten years ago, and five, ten years from now, you'll have a, a completely, I think, new wave uh, skill set. Um, and hopefully we're all developing those leaders of the future who can appear before audit committees, who can speak on policy matters, who can creatively plan, who can make sure they can get the financial statements right, and who can do it all efficiently. That's easy. Sounds like a small task. Yes, a small yeah. task. <laughs> Joe, tell us how we do that. Yeah, so I'll just, I'll echo a couple of the same thoughts, right? I mean, at the end of the day, right, as everyone, you want good leaders and good communicators and people who can be very diverse, you still have to file a tax return, right? You still have to make sure your, your financials are right uh, and, and there's planning and controversy and things. So you have to make sure you have a, a level of competence, which, which is what Harris said, I guess the other point which, which I've seen, and it's, it sort of ebbs and flows, is just a resource constraint, right? So there's always a budget, there's always, uh, there's always activity on the budget, and it's always difficult to get the right people in the right place. Um, there's always a demand for resources across the enterprise. And so I think, I think part of the, the job of, of, a, of a senior tax person is to be able to communicate to senior management why you need these resources, how you need them, what the risks are, so it gets back to the same communication point, but I do think it's important to have the right people monitoring and working on these things. At the end of the day, it's a risk reward, right? You're, you're putting money into the tax department to make sure you're, um, you're efficient on, on all these issues. Great point, Joe, thank you. We, we have roughly five minutes that we'd like to uh, open up to the audience for questions. So um, any questions, we'd be happy to field them. I guess, uh, well, Sean? So my question was uh, on getting rulings. Is this something that, uh, that, that you guys are, are still thinking about as an important part of, of uh, the way you manage risk, or is now with exposure and particularly the the publication of these rulings, is that, is that going to make it less likely to go for this? So how, how do you approach that whole area? Well, I, I think rulings are like two kinds, right? I think on the APA kind of arrangements, if you call them a, a ruling, I think those are still, still okay. I mean, you're just trying to get a, a certainty on your pricing arrangement, which I think would continue into the future. The, the kind of rulings you're referring to, Sean, are mostly the, um, the rulings where you have some kind of beneficial tax arrangement with that specific country. Now, that's really not about certainty, isn't it? It's more about planning around your effective tax rate, probably. So I, I would say the first kind is still very relevant unless you know, people have other views, which I think are going to get more and more important in this 
world of uncertainty we are entering into now. So that's just my view. Yeah. Um, well, one comment on that is that um, it, it, part of the dynamic that we're not particularly focusing on as we're from businesses is how tough the current environment is for taxing authorities around the world who are often coming under attack in the political process in their own country. Um, maybe one version of that is the IRS being underfunded. There's a, there's a little bit different story with the IRS. But for example, in Australia, where uh, the government uh, certainly is in a, a swirl of controversy, the uh, APA process has, has pretty much ground to a halt. And I, I think it's in part because it's very hard for the government, even on APAs that are completely non-controversial, to grant them right now. So we're in, a, we're in a transitional period with BEPS uh, and with things that spawned where um, the ability of so, at least some governments to function efficiently is impacted and it's, it's difficult. So in the past, you would always get an APA in Australia. At this point, you may choose not to spend two, three years trying to renew your APA that's non-controversial. <coughs> so it's changing practice. Other questions from the audience? Yes. Are you getting um, pressure from senior leadership in, in light of everything that's going on around the world to continue to reduce your tax rate, maintain your tax rate, or, oh my God, keep us out of the papers? <laughs> Great question. Who wants to field that one? <laughs> I, I'll take that. Uh, I mean, you know, senior management wants, let's say, a low tax rate without a problem. So, uh, you know, it's, you know, <laughs> they want their cake and eat it too. Uh, and, you know, I think the tax director and the tax department's job is to sort of indicate what the trade-offs might be, um, have a reasoned discussion, uh, think about what it might look like, bring in your corp comms group. But, um, you know, I think in general, because of BEPS and what's going to happen, corporate tax rates will probably be going up um, over, you know, there's, you know, there's, I think there's uh, waves. I think corporate tax rates are going to go up until someone figures out that corporations really don't pay taxes, and maybe they shouldn't but they'll probably be going up, and I think there's an expectation that they probably will be. Um, the question is whether there's gonna be some dead bodies along the way that really are unintended to be caught up in, in something else. Um, but I, I haven't seen a great change from, can we have our cake and eat it too? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think the other point I'll make is it's, it's on a relative basis, right? So depending on where you do business and, and what industry you're in, the, the range of sort of what's an appropriate effective tax rate, we question whether that's the best measure of a tax department's efficiency to begin with. Um, it depends on sort of your criteria. So I, I think it's a good question. I think it's a bit of a moving target though. And I think eventually even the senior management in the company want to look at it from a balanced perspective, right? right. Like it's our job to make sure we explain if this is the way you want to go, these are the consequences. And most times you would think they would do the right thing overall, you know, from a, from a, from a company, a corporate perspective. So, yeah, it's. That's a, a great way to uh, end it, uh, Kanthi. You know, do, do the right thing and have the right resources and the right tax department to ensure that you do it. So thank you very much, panel. Thank Excellent you. discussion. Thank you. Thank you.